<laughs> Hi, welcome to Sustain Talks. Today I'm joined by Dominic Offer, Director of Sustainability and Business Development at Bristol Global Mobility. Me and Dominic had a chat the other day. This is why I do the Sustain Talks. We had a brilliant conversation and I just wanted to share it. So we're going to have the conversation over again. Dominic, um, really good to have you here again. Uh, really um, looking forward to sharing this and, uh, and your journey in sustainability. But why don't you tell us a little bit more about that and how you got to where you are now? Thanks, Sam. Um... Yeah, I think me personally, I've always been involved in some form of sustainability, whether I've known it or not. Um, you know, from a very young age, you know, seven years old, I did a fast for Kosovo um, when that was happening. And, and at that point, you know, I was just very engaged with what was happening in the world and recognizing there was people suffering. And, you know, throughout different stages of my life, I've gone to, you know, doing part vegetarianism and, and you know, trying to be as uh, eco-friendly as possible and, and all these actions. And it was only until maybe about four or five years ago, someone was kind of like, oh, there's a name for that. Um, and it really kind of changed when I read a book by Mon Chenard, who's the founder of Patagonia. Uh, called Let My People Go Surfing. Um, if anyone hasn't read it, it's it's well worth a read. And that really ignited something in me. Um, and I started being more active in the kind of sustainability scene. And um, when we hit COVID, um, there was a series of David Attenborough um, documentaries that came out. And I remember watching this and then standing up and kind of pacing around my house going like we're not doing enough um went to my boss um a truly inspiring woman called valerie wakem and she i, I think she might have had the same epiphany because like, i talked to her and she was like look go away if you believe there's something that we can be done and she's done this all throughout my career um go put it together and then bring it back and let's see what we can do. And I did that. And, you know, she really drove um, that happening within Bristol. And uh, it was myself and another person um, who no longer works in Bristol now, but we created a whole structure in the middle of COVID when all this madness was going on and took it to our leadership. And they said, you're right. Yeah, we definitely need to do this um but we're in the middle of the worst pandemic you know this this uh this generation has ever seen we don't have the resources to do this so if you want to do this this is going to have to be on your own time and you know what we did was reach out to our organization and say is there anyone cares about sustainability and six or seven people came back and went yeah so we created a committee and then drove our sustainability initiative to, to where it is now, building it on partnerships with companies like Planet Mark, Just One UK, Prospera, B1G1, uh, Includability. As we've gone along, we've picked up partners who really kind of build upon what our ethos is around our company, which is connecting with people versus controlling them, and then building that into our sustainability initiative which is called Move the World. Um, so it's been a bit of a journey and we've been, you know, recognized by Planet Mark um, as finalist and award in communicating sustainability, um, you know, talking and working with lots of people within our industry um, to the point where it's, it's now got so much um, kind of momentum that Bristol, um, said right let's set up a sustainability department so that's what we've done and I'm very lucky to lead it. Brilliant um, let, let's just talk a bit more about what Bristol Global Mobility does because people might not recognize the name um, and then we can sort of go in a little bit deeper about what you've done within um, becoming a more sustainable business. Yeah, absolutely. So Bristol uh, Global Mobility is an international relocation company. Um, so uh, for people that aren't familiar, which many people <laughs> aren't unless you've moved internationally, um, 
is we work with uh, corporate clients to recognize they might have someone saying going from London to New York or I don't know, uh, Bangladesh to Japan or something like that. And what we do is uh, we support their relocation. So that might be tax, immigration, um, uh, moving household goods, getting them there, finding them houses, language training, cultural training. If you imagine anything that you might need from moving from one point in the world to another, even if it's 10 miles down the road, Bristol kind of supports clients with that through a, a network of vendors. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we do. Um, How many people do you move a year? Over 20,000. Wow. Um, yeah, we do it. I can't remember the last figures, but it's between, I think it's between about 22 and 25,000 uh, moves a year. And that's a full move. Um, it's not a partial stay, you know, is it, could it be like a three months or it is a full, you're moving a family, a person um, to, to stay for a long period of time? Yeah, there's, uh, there's definitely different types. So you could have someone who's just going for three months, for example. Um, they'll go in, we'll sort them out temporary housing, get them an airship and for their household goods, it will like a lot of suitcases they might want to take with, um, to full three-year assignments where, um, you know, they take their family, where, you know, looking after their house back home, um, finding them a new house, getting 40-foot container shipped around the world um, to people who just go on projects. For yeah. two weeks, they go in, stay in some temporary living, and then we get them out. So, okay. yeah, a, so, a very large range of things. Yeah, so a lot of emissions in moving people about. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so you, you found your passion and you wanted to make a change. Where did you start when you were like, right, let's start with what? what do you start with? Yeah, I started with panicking mainly. Um, you know, <laughs> how, Don't how scare you... people, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think that's the biggest question I get asked, and most people yeah. within sustainability get asked, I believe, um, is where do you start? And it's, it's sometimes a tricky one, but um, what we did was start with our core business. So look at what internally we we do, what we're able to change um, and how we're able to make small steps into progress. And then we can look at things that are more complicated, like, you know, household good emission and everything like that. So the first thing we did is we created a plan. Um, and I think this is the, the best way for any company to go and it doesn't have to be this mad detailed you know kind of graphs and charts and all that kind of thing really what you just have to understand is what are the core parts of your business and what do you believe that you can do to to reduce or support sustainability bristol and this is this is kind of around me um, and the way that I work. We went full pace at it. Um, we created a strategy and looked at what we could do within the industry as well as our, our company. Yeah. Um, and that's where we brought on a provider, uh, Planet Mark, um, because we worked on the basis that we needed to really start to understand measurement of emissions within our, not only our company, but also potentially our industry as well. And so we brought them on and through their template, we started working out, right, what are the emissions within our business that we can reduce, you know, paper consumption, business travel, you know, even things like light bulbs. Yeah. Um, and who's working from home, who's not. Um, and and that, that really kind of gave us a lot of guidance. I wouldn't say that it's the way for everyone. The the one thing that I say to quite a lot of companies because we're you know we're a we're a global company, so we do have resources to be able to put this to a degree. Um, and there's small mom and pop organisations who, you know, they're working on a family basis. They've got a couple of people running a a small 
company who do really well, how are they meant to go spend X amount of money on getting measurements and, and all this thing? And the, the thing that in reflection as well that I say to people is start with the small things and build. So chart what your energy usage is or your paper usage is or, you know, these really kind of normal things, the stereotypical things that we think of in terms of sustainability, they are there for a reason. So if you're worried about spending money on sustainability, you're not sure what you're doing. You know, I use this as quite a basic example, but if you stop buying paper, then you don't need toner, you don't need ink, you don't need to buy another printer when it breaks down. Hey, you could even sell your printer. If you can work out what money you were spending on before to once you stop doing that, that's efficiency. And that's the whole point of sustainability. Being a sustainable company makes you more efficient. If you can work out, work out the cost versus the new efficiency, instead of putting that into your bottom line, because you're making the same amount of profit you always have been, you haven't done anything different otherwise, other than stop buying paper and put that into a budget. Mm. And all of a sudden you've got a sustainability budget. And yeah. that budget can then evolve because you can find the next efficiency. And by the time you start realizing that your business is becoming more efficient and you've got a budget, you'll also find that you've got someone with passion in the business around sustainability and give them the opportunity to do something about it. Um, and, you know, the other big piece is you can put anyone, as long as they've got an interest in it, I would yeah. say is the big thing. You know, if you're a big corporation and you've got money, go hire someone in sustainability. Yeah. That's the one thing I say. If you're not, you haven't got those funds, <laughs> get someone interested but train in them like invest in them so you know the the cambridge institute of sustainable learning their basic course it's like 220 quid mm -hmm. and we ask for you know degrees in five years experience in all other areas of our business or, and then when it comes to sustainability, it's like, oh, cool, we're just going to put Deborah or James from finance and, you know, that's part of your job now. See what you can do. Yeah. And I see that a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, even higher up people who, who don't really know what they're doing. They're just taking it on as part of their job because it's a buzzword. Mm -hmm. So, you know, empower the person that's got that role and train them even if it's a little bit, but give them the ability to be trained. And, yeah. you know, it makes a big difference. I, I loved what you said. Um, we, we spoke about this the other day, and I think it's something that people always say, oh, but it's so expensive. And I'm like, it's not expensive. It, you know, sustainability can save you. Um, and I like the way that you're like, well, you can save money here and then invest it into a person, into education, into communication. And actually what that ends up doing for your business is great, too, because if you're out there and you're giving this fabulous sustainability um, uh, communication about your business surely that's going to attract more customers because everyone wants to work with companies that are being more sustainable right? yeah yeah that's exactly it and do you know what once you've trained that person in sustainability they will then have the skills to go and find you more efficiencies yeah and by the time that you know you need your c-suite buying you need your your leadership buying um because you that's how you make things happen our person needs to be empowered, but this is the element of it that people get wrong about sustainability. There is big cost impacts like getting electric fleets and solar panels. That's big cost, but guess what? That will save you money over the long term, but there's lots and lots you can do as a company in the meantime, if you're not quite ready, that doesn't require you know, um, doesn't require these big outlying costs. Mm. And um, that's the approach we need to take to sustainability, you know, recognizing that one direction doesn't fit all. Um, and it's something that is part of my everyday message is 
trying to get procurement teams and big companies to realize that the journey that they're on to become more sustainable isn't the same journey that smaller companies are on that are part of their supply chain. Yeah. Um, and there's a really, I'm sure loads of sustainability people would disagree with me, maybe, but um, my personal view is that we're in a bit of a, a dangerous place at the moment because there's lots of companies who are driving very heavy um, sustainability um, processes and uh, requests down their supply chain with, first of all, not really understanding what they mean for a, a smaller supplier um, and kind of taking that, that mindset that we do have in, in um, especially westernized businesses is, you know, if you're working for us, this is what you need to do. But when you count in GDPR, health and safety, asking for the, you know, the best quality performance at the absolute rock bottom price, and then you talk about sustainability, it's, it's a lot to do sometimes. Um, if you're being requested to do these big admin forms, if you're being requested to, you know, deliver certain data on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, that's where you're not taking into account the, the mom and pops organizations who they just can't afford to do it. They don't have the resources to do it. So that's why every journey really matters. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's important as, as clients to take that into account. Um, yeah. And um, what's been your biggest challenge on your journey to becoming a more sustainable business? <laughs> um, I think there's there's several. Um, I think there's been loads of lessons learned, um, but it's probably communicating across a global network with real effectiveness and um, really being able to demonstrate what what we're trying to do. Um, and I was talking to this. Um, to the, the president of our company and our, our managing director actually not, not so long ago is it creates, we're growing an entire department that we've had nothing, we've never never done anything in, well we have, but we've never really labeled it or understood that that's what we're doing. And it's a lot, it's, it's an awful lot. It's, um, you know, you're, you're asking, and this is in what we're doing, but you're asking a lot of people who have very busy day jobs to think differently and act differently. And everyone has been so engaged with Bristol. But one of the hardest things is to keep that momentum. And um, I was at an amazing, amazing uh, conference uh, from Fidi in, in Cannes in France. Lucky enough to talk to, um, to many people um, along some, some great speakers. Um, and one of the things that we came up with is progress rather than precision. And we've made so much progress that one of the biggest challenges is there's been points that it's, it's driven really far, really fast. And now what we're doing is we're going back and putting in the precision that has allowed us to get where we need to be. So in that challenge, it's getting everyone engaged again, making sure that everyone's comfortable with what they're doing and knows what they can do and, and it's effective um, because you're doing it across a whole organization and, and you know there's a lot to it so it's, it's definitely challenging getting kind of all of the the points right as you're trying to make progress um, but it's it's also good is is learning and out of it has come some great things yeah um, so, yeah, it's um, challenging but positive. Um, one, one of the um, final questions that I was going to ask, and you said one of the challenges as well, but what has been your biggest lesson through this? Um, personally or, or Bristol? Both. Both. Um, I, think, I think for Bristol it's, it's been in a degree where where the industry stands you know uh, like you 
pointed out, we are big emitters, um, not only within Brittle, but our, our whole our whole industry. We are kind of involved in quite a lot of emissions when you think about flying people places, household goods, freighting, you know, taking people on home finds and cars and, you know, all, all the rest of it. Um, and it's about how we need to, to move as an industry, um, you know, and we have to kind of move past this real competitive, we don't work with our supplier, uh, we don't work with our competitors, when are in an environment in an arena where we have to engage with our competitors and that's that's been difficult you know we're really really good at speaking to our supply chain and and the people that we move and and you know our own teams but being more open which our leadership has has kind of jumped at and, and been really good with but it's been challenging we've released everything that we have for free um so that has also been a challenge. Um, you know, we, in what I was talking about the, in working with suppliers, Bristol has created a, a program where we're not asking our supply chain to fill in loads of documents or go onto portals and take weeks to get the information that we need. What we've done is use our system to try and capture as much data as possible and then um, we're giving that information back to suppliers for free. Hopefully lifting up the idea of sustainability rather than pushing it down. Um, we've had some really good feedback on it as well. Um, for me personally, it's, I'm a, people call me the passionate sustainability guy. Um, and I think the, some of the, one of the biggest challenges is recognizing people aren't in the same space. I think for many people in sustainability, and you might feel it as well, is sometimes it feels like you're going to scream into a pillow. Because <laughs> uh, there's, there's um, you know, there's there's people, and it's rightfully so, that they haven't been surrounded by the information. It might be that it's a bit too much for them, culturally, whatever it is. Um, and... So there's been elements that I've had to really learn. I'm not always the most patient person, but I actually had to learn to step back and go, right, well, we have only got seven years to absolute catastrophe, but in that seven years, we have to educate, we have to be patient, we have to guide people, we have to be part of positive change. And, you know, being impatient, you know, belittling people belittling people's ideas which I don't do but you know generally getting frustrated with people isn't going to get people on board yeah you know, it's just going to push them further away scare them that there's too much information it's about patiently kind of going have you thought about this you know you're worried about jobs and you know everything like that but by 2030, based on the, the temperatures in, in Pakistan and India, 30% of the country might become uninhabitable. When you look at that, that's mass migration. And it's not the only place that that's going to happen. And that's not necessarily migrating to any other country. But as you group collective people, they create more, some, more emissions. And then you've got things around poverty and inequalities so you know this is a really challenging thing that you have to kind of patiently try and work with people educate people and you see that patience is is well paid off in every interaction you have but it's mm. not, not not within me as a, a normal human being Dominic it's why I do sustainable <laughs> talks it's why I have these conversations I put it out for free um uh, I do our monthly webinars are free it's if I can guide inspire help um share as much information to simplify sustainability and social responsibility um then then I'll do it and you know having the conversation with people like you just um and listening to i've heard i've had this conversation so many times but it never gets old and it never um it never sounds the same because 
every person's sustainability journey is different and yeah. everyone is um, either in a different industry or um, in a different business. It, it's all unique to that person and that company. And um, that just leaves me with uh, saying thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you for sharing your journey. Uh, and thank you to, um, to your organisation for giving you the um, the power to do that and to share it with other people. And I think that collaboration is absolutely key. And um, yeah, I um, I'm really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. There, thank you, Sam. Cheers. Good. All right, have a good day. Yeah, you too.